Välkomna till Kastelholm slott. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests and friends of Åland and the Åland Islands Peace Institute. Also all those from further away who are following live, you're all very welcome to this ninth Kastelholm Talks on Peace on the Åland Demilitarization Day. The theme this year is going to be is peace, war, and money, money, money. Some have asked, why do you have money, money, money three times? Well, we have three excellent speakers, so money, money, money. Um, and they will be speaking about money spent, money gained, and money invested, among the many things that they will be addressing. We are here at the Kastelholm uh, uh, medieval castle which is a place which prompts us not only through its beauty but also through its long history to keep the long track of issues and engage in thinking not only about the particularities of our own time here and now but in the long run what do these questions mean for our societies and life on this planet. Before we continue with our dialogue, which as always is going to be curious and respectful, we know from the outset that our speakers have very different views and very different backgrounds. Before pursuing the, the conversation, we will however listen to the pattern of the Kastelholm Peace Talks. President Arya Hallonen. Uh, she is very much missed, however uh, excellent Peter may be, he cannot fully cover the, 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 the corner there of President Hallonen. And President Hallonen was uh, very keen uh, for the theme that we have chosen, so she has sent us her uh, message and regards. And we listen now to President Arya Hallonen. Jag är glad över att skicka varma hälsningar till Kasteholms samtal om fred. Tyvärr kan jag inte delta i detta viktiga evansemang i år på plats uh, på den vackra åren. Men jag önskar er alla givande diskussioner och trevliga möten. Dear participants, it's my great pleasure to extend my warmest regards to the Kasteholm Peace Talks. This year topic peace, war, and money gives an opportunity for very multidimensional discussions on the resources and the cost of the war, as well uh, as the benefits of the peace. We are currently living in very challenging times. Geopolitical divisions are growing. The world is facing the highest number of violent conflicts since the Second World War. There is ongoing war now, also in Europe. Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine has changed the security situation of our region. The war has caused already immense human sufferings and heavy economic losses in Ukraine, but also for the future concerning recovery and reconstruction. At the same time, it has had a global impact on food, energy and finance systems. We in here in, uh, we here in Western Europe have supported Ukraine with various forms to share. Finland has given, for example, over 900 million euros in support of Ukraine. We have also offered temporary protection for more than 50,000 Ukrainians fleeing the war. The atmosphere, not only countries at the war, but also in nearby regions, can easily change from peaceful and diverse societies uh, to the black and white world of the war. Dear participants, at the same, we are approaching tipping points of climate change and nature loss. The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed and deepened inequalities around the world. A triple crisis of energy, food security and finance is ongoing. All these multiply and interconnected crises are affecting our security. The impacts of ratings especially heavily on people and countries in vulnerable situations. It is vital 
uh, that we assess how resources are best used to achieve a safer and sustainable future. These questions are important for states, local communities, organizations, economy and business, as well as us individuals, human beings. As UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has said, was greatest cost, it is the human toll. I strongly believe that the Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development is the key to solving many of today's challenges. It is no peace without sustainable development and no development without peace. When we consider peace, war and money, a wise investment is to spend on peace building and achieving socially, environmentally, and economically sustainable development for all. Once again, I thank you for your attention. I, I wish you a very fruitful day of discussions. And please, I'm interested also to hear your uh, op opinions uh, afterwards with hoping the very great day. Thank you to President Hallonan. And we excuse her for not being here with uh, gratefulness because she has invested her time in keeping diplomacy going as much as possible in spite of the ongoing conflicts and uh, tensions. So she spoke also in, in triple several times, talking about resources, causes and benefits, uh, talking about food, energy and finance. So it seems to me that we often think in these triple aspects of, of issues. And it's excellent that we have three speakers from um, three different continents and three different, very different backgrounds. We will give each about five minutes for a first um, reflection on the actual theme. What, what are uh, the way uh, President Hallonen made her take uh, on, on the subject? And we have asked our speakers to do the same. Uh, I will present them one by one uh, in between the, the positions that they will have, starting by Professor Netta Crawford, who is Professor of, of International Relations at Balliol College at the University of Oxford, who comes from the US uh, with a long track record in, in various institutions there, and where she has also taken initiative uh, more than uh, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, uh, at Brown University starting what uh, is well known as the Costs of War Project. Uh, she has received a numbers of um, uh, acclamations and prizes, including the 2003 American Political Science Association Award for Best Book in International History and Politics. Uh, for her book, Argument and Change in World Politics, Ethics, Decolonization, and Humanitarian Intervention. And her latest book uh, is very much linked to the theme today, is Pentagon, Climate Change, and War. Uh, Professor Crawford, um, you're very welcome, and we're very grateful you are here. We're also very happy that this is the first time we have the Kastelholm Talks on Peace in English, uh, because we hope that this will also be bridging some of the discourses taking place um, on the other side of the Atlantic to what is discussed here in Europe. The floor is yours. Talk. Um, I'm really grateful that this discussion is in English. <laughs> and so I'll, I'm, uh, as you said, an American, and I'll begin uh, in 1963 with President Eisenhower, who was then in retirement, writing these words. There is no way in which a country can satisfy the craving for absolute security, but it can easily bankrupt itself morally and economically in an attempt to reach that illusory goal through arms alone. So Eisenhower, I think, was referring to an old uh, question, which is how do you 
then make peace, right? So um, you could say, as the Romans did, si vi passum parabellum, that is, if you want peace, prepare for war. Or you could say, si vi passum parapatchum, which is if you want peace, prepare for peace. And that's the tension that's gonna run through what I say today. What, what is it that we do? So I'll begin uh, where the, you began today with these remarks, which is where we are today. Um, we're either, depending on where you live, in an armed peace as humans, or we're at war, or we are living in security communities of some sort. That is, uh, in the expectation that disputes among groups will be resolved by discussion. So that's the kind of world we're in, which is multiple worlds at many times. Um, we are also in a, in a climate where CIPRI, my colleague to the left is part of this, um, has told us that in 2021, total global military spending reached over two trillion annually. Now I know that the country that I come from is a good part of that. Um, this year it's 800 billion, more than 800 billion annually US dollars. And the U.S. Uh, also spends over 51% of its, all of its discretionary spending on the military. And then if you add uh, uh, Homeland Security, which is highly militarized, and veteran spending, which is related to the support of our veterans, who are actually millions of people, uh, that is much higher. So a good portion of the United States, which is actually surrounded by two moats, and two friendly countries, uh, the United States government spending is about defense, but um, defense of the homeland is pretty much secure. So it's about some other vision of defense, which is forward defense. Now we could move to a new world, a different world. We are in fact moving to a new world uh, where we're still gonna have those <coughs> other worlds that I described, but or we could have, um, a uh, world that is characterized by increased climate change caused instability and migration, refugees, um, misery, and uh, we could also see, and we're in the midst of it now, increased tension over the hegemonic transition which is occurring, the movement away from American dominance to another world where the Chinese are, are increasingly dominant. So we're in the midst of a hegemonic transition. And international relations theory tells us that hegemonic transitions are notoriously <laughs> unstable. They're, uh, more, we're more likely to see conflicts erupting into something more violent. And then we have the geostrategic implications of living in a green energy transition at the same time that we're living in a sort of uh, odd fossil fuel world where the countries with um, fossil fuels are trying to madly pump those fuels and sell them as quickly as they can. And of course we cannot afford the greenhouse gas emissions that are associated with that. We just can't um, and hope to leave the world um, to my children and yours in any kind of livable condition. So then the key question is a transition to the peace system. How do we make a transition from what I believe is a war system, even in those places where um, there's armed peace, um, to the peace system? So what are the components of the war system? Well, they, they begin fundamentally with beliefs about human nature, that we're aggressive, that we're uh, we, unable, unable to trust each other, okay? That we're acquisitive. So these beliefs about human nature are actually constant if you talk uh, to most people, depending on where you are, we, they're very deeply held. And we think that uh, this human nature has been the same for the, you know, the last 5,000 years. Okay, then we have institutions that come from those beliefs, which are armed forces, military industry, and the taxes to pay for both, the state system that supports the, the taxation. So then uh, along with that, we've got manpower and fuel, bases and alliances. Now all of this is uh, sort of seen as good, just, virtuous and right. There's a normative backing for the war system. By contrast, there's a peace system that's possible. 
Now, does it depend on a different view of human nature, or does it depend on a different human nature? Would we have to change our human natures? Now, I think the, the evidence on this is that human nature is rather complex. Not only do we have um, these, you know, what Hobbes called nasty, brutish, and short environments created by this fear of all against all, but we have uh, capacities for nurturance and for care and uh, for peaceful dispute resolution. So what does this peace system look like? It looks like Poland. It looks like nonviolent dispute resolution. It looks like the rule of law that is revisable and democratic. And democracy assumes, in other words, that we put down the sword to talk, right? Uh, and the, the more war, the less democracy within, the more conflict, the less democracy within a group, and uh, the more ex external fighting, often the less democracy within a society as people give up rights to participate in a conflict. And then, of course, it, it presumes the absence of physical, structural, and cultural violence. Okay, so th these are Galtung's uh, phrases, right? The physical violence the, of brute force, the structural violence of inequality that leads to shortened lifespans, and the cultural violence of the denial of other people's uh, identities and practices. So we need alternative models to get there. Now, uh, we just heard that there's no peace without sustainable development. I think there's no peace without democracy. So then how do we get to peace? And how many more minutes do I have? One and a half. In one and a half minutes. OK. So I'll, I'll suggest something that I hope you ask me about, which is uh, we get there. At the, the way there is through transitioning military doctrines. And, and what do I mean by that? Uh, the NATO military doctrine and U.S. military doctrine is based on offense. It's, NATO is a defensive community um, where Article 5 says any member who's attacked, you'll come to their defense, right? But the, the actual way to come to some other party's defense is through offense. That's the way this, the doctrine works. You don't wait, you, de you hope to deter, but you, and you don't wait for them to come to you, to your territory, you go after them in the deep areas, right? You, you go after their lines of communication and uh, reinforcements. There is another doctrine, it's, it's not offensive, it's defensive defense, which is um, where you aim to deter and deny an adversary uh, and the ability to occupy you by making occupation difficult, if not impossible, right? So that making it difficult increases the expense of, of going to war, and that can have the deterrent effect. So the denial is anti-access and it's area denial. So the benefit of this other kind of military doctrine is to uh, decrease the security dilemma. In other words, if I have a strategy that's premised on being capable of attacking you deep in your rear, the enemy's rear, then they're afraid that that's not a defensive strategy, that's an offensive strategy. So they fear that you intend to attack them. So your defensive preparation can be seen as offensive. When they react to your defensive preparation, which they perceive as offensive, they may increase their military spending, their military forces, and they look more aggressive to you. So you can get into these reciprocal spirals, reciprocal fear of surprise attack. So defensive, defensive doctrines, uh, or non-offensive defense doctrines, can decrease these security dilemma dynamics. And there are technical ways to do this. There are uh, arms control ways to move towards this world. But I believe that this is a a step towards the more peaceful system. And that's what we need now. We need baby steps for babies to get out of the sort of world that we're in and um, the, the possible future world that we could remake if we don't reconceive our understanding of what is possible. Thank you. I think we will for sure return to this also because uh, Nan comes here from a, a different perspective uh, looking at, um, at um, uh, 
sub-Saharan Africa, but also the globe uh, and its military spending with different uh, positions, not only superpower position with a great offensive as well as defensive capacity, but also more being squeezed between the different um, interests and fears coming from different corners. And Dr. Nantian, you're too very welcome. You are an economist. Um, we had uh, Netta Crawford being a, a political scientist and, and coming from international relations. You come from economy and you have been uh, uh, writing your original uh, thesis very much on the overlap between development and military spending. So at the core of what uh, President Hallonen was talking about. And now you're a senior researcher at CIPRI working with the military expenditure program, which is the original core work of CIPRI um, and its uh, logic. So um, you will tell us what military expenditure really is, which I think is a, a question in itself. And perhaps we can link it later on to what is military expen expenditure, which is offensive uh, and, and defensive. Uh, but you have also worked, uh, you come originally from South Africa and have worked in, in Cape Town, and you have worked with climate change issues and environmental issues in, in the Worldwide Fund for Nature. So very welcome, we're very happy you were able to make it here. And the floor is yours for your understanding about peace, war, and money, money, money. Thank you for uh, this warm introduction, uh, and I too am very grateful that this discussion is gonna be in English. Um, so I wanna start by saying that despite what I'm about to say, I am an optimist. Maybe a worried optimist, but deep down an optimist. Um, so last week, as I was preparing uh, for the opening remarks of this discussion, focusing of course on the three words of peace, war, and money, um, I got an interview request um, from journalists asking for me to summarize for them what has happened in the past year to military spending, to arms trade, to the arms industry since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And it really made me reflect um, on the topics that I've really been engaged with over the past year. And for someone that really works at Peace Research Institute, what I realized is that I have spent an awful amount of time thinking, speaking, writing, uh, and you know, discussing war and money and almost no attention has really been put on the word peace. Um, and I think this really reflects the current state of the world right now. Um, so I'll start by talking about war. Um, the international security environment is currently really dominated by intensifying conflict confrontations by two nuclear-powered states. On one hand, you have Russia and Ukraine, uh, with US and its allies supporting and defending Ukraine. Uh, then on the other hand, you have China and the US, and China's increased pressure of reunification of Taiwan. And in the former case, what we know is that it now it's the biggest conflict in Europe since World War II. In the latter case, we're at a rather unclear, uncertain situation, but one that is really escalating tensions uh, and rhetoric. Um, and so really focusing on the, the war in Ukraine and the confrontation with China and US, um, it does not really that downplay the other significant warring events that have occurred over the past year. Right? We have the, the war in Ethiopia, um, the military coup and the resultant violence in Myanmar, um, the, the violence uh, civilians in Afghanistan. So really 2022 is, has been a year where there's now more war than any time since the end of World War II. Um, with, I think the estimates suggest 56 open armed conflicts uh, in 56 uh, countries uh, around the world. Uh, fatalities from war is also rising, with a number of casualties or fatalities in non-state and state-based conflicts, the highest we've seen since the end of the Cold War. Um, you know, by some estimates, people say that uh, by February this year, 200,000 Russian troops have died since the invasion began. Over 100,000 Ukrainian troops and civilians have been either wounded or killed. Um, but I think the scale of this conflict, the, 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 the Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, is much broader than, of course, just the, the, the number of deaths that we have seen. But you know, on the other hand, 
a war that has much less been discussed or you see in the news uh, that uh, in the Tigrayan province of Ethiopia, um, which is a far more deadly conflict that since the, since the conflict began, uh, between 300 and 600,000 people have perished. Um, so despite the fact that these are estimates, um, these examples really point towards uh, a world where war is maybe more common and that the consequences simply become numbers and statistics. Moving on to the term money, I think 2022 really is a year where for most people it's really about inflation and cost of living. But for me, it really is the reaction that Europe has had since Russia's invasion and the increases in the announced increases in military spending in the course of 2022. And of course, the arms buildup in East Asia, really between Taiwan, Japan, and China. Um, as Neta had mentioned, um, world military spending is at all time high. Uh, over $2 trillion has been spent on the military. I must be careful with giving actual statistics because I'm under um, embargo by CIPRI because we have our latest uh, data being launched in three weeks time. And I cannot any, give any specific figures, but I can give you know, general trends. Mm -hmm. um, so military spending has really been increasing consistently since 2015, mm -hmm. really the year after Russia's annexation of the Crimea. Um, and this increase in military spending really reflects, I think, uh, a perception amongst many governments that the security situation has deteriorated to a state where it needs kind of military buildup for security, military strength. Um, and despite, I think, you know, we can have a separate discussion, a very important discussion on the validity of increases in military spending or the allocation to the military, I think what we can agree on is that the rising global military spending is a sign that we are living in an increasingly insecure world. Um, some, some general figures is that the nine states that possess a nuclear weapons today are all in the process of modernizing its nuclear forces. Um, in the most expensive case, the US is estimated to will spend $1.5 trillion uh, all the way up to about 2040 on modernization of its weapons. So in a world with a finite pot of financial resources where governments are facing a myriad of challenges from climate change, food security, maybe military security, job creation, uh, pension reform, um, and the fact that all these sectors really uh, is fighting for this limited pot of resources and all these areas need increased spending. One really important question for me is, where is the money going to come from? How are governments going to fund uh, these expenditure decisions? And what are the consequences to these uh, spending decisions? Um, finally, leaving kind of the most, maybe the most important word for last, peace. Yet, of course, for me, the least discussed of the three words. Um, I find that and the positiveness is that they are still, most states in the world are still in the presence of peace. Right? Only 56 uh, countries are in conflict. But the worrying case is that despite the increasing number of conflicts in the world, um, there are less and less peace agreements being seen year on year. Um, of course, there are two important peace agreements that occurred in 2022. The one between the Tigrayan forces and Ethiopian government that was signed in November 2022. And another one in Sudan between the civil, uh, civilian and military leaders, which really ended the, kind of the, the military coup that started in 2020. <laughs> so, I mean, when we're living in a, what you consider a more uncertain and insecure world, um, peace really means different things to different people. For most of us uh, sitting here, we're really talking about maybe a sustainable peace, a positive peace, right? A peace that really addresses the root cause of the conflict, there's politi uh, political inclusiveness, legitimacy in preventing future conflicts. But in many areas around the world, um, peace is really a fragile peace, a negative peace, where peace is simply a state of absent armed fighting. Um, and so maybe finally circling back on why I still believe that you know, I'm an optimist, is that I think despite these challenges, we see that peace is possible, that peace is still the most important uh, point that we should be striving for. And that at a more of a macroeconomic level, we as humanity are in a much better situation than we have been in, in the past decades. Economic development, the money that's been allocated in different ways to decrease poverty, decrease income inequality, improve healthcare access, education, life expectancy. Um, we talked about in the agenda 2030. Really, we are kind of 
working together towards a, a common goal, a common, a common agenda. And so I think with, despite all these challenges, um, there's still a lot of good and a lot of positive to take uh, if we work towards peace. Thank you. Thank you, um, Nan. So you, you share the notion of insecurity very much with the analysis that was, uh, that was done with, with uh, Netta. Um, how do we cope with this insecurity? How do we address it in uh, terms of uh, solving conflicts between different goals uh, and the different tools that we operate with to meet these goals? And Netta takes it uh, one step further. How do we think con uh, around the basic notions we have? Uh, uh, or on um, human nature and the way democracy operates around these questions. But you also used another term, the term macroeconomic level, that is the level of states and state economies. And we have the other microeconomic level, the, the, the actors, the economic actors, the businesses um, in our societies that also have to take uh, position and to navigate in these murky waters of insecurity that the current situation operates. And for that um, reason, we are very happy that Peter Wiklöf uh, accepted to be one of the speakers this year. And, and Peter is um, happy because he has done his uh, annual meeting with the board yesterday, so he is uh, perhaps more, most relaxed than any other day, uh, at least if, if uh, the business is going good. And that is another positive effect that we have, in fact, quite uh, positive um, economic developments in some countries, not uh, overall. Uh, Peter, Peter Wiklöf is uh, the, the CEO and director of Orlandsbanken. He is also the chair of the Orland Chamber of Commerce, uh, a position that he has had uh, quite some time. He's a lawyer by background, but he has worked more in corporate life and business uh, than in law. Uh, he, uh, his bank is also uh, quite known for its sustainability efforts, perhaps uh, monitoring emissions in our consumption patterns. Uh, and uh, he has also been sometime uh, now involved in sustainability networks on, on Orland. So, Peter, we're very welcome. And this is... Um, not only about sustainability in the environmental sense, but also the sustainability of peace efforts. The floor is yours. Th thank you, Zian. And in a way, I must be the odd guy here because I, I have not, not studied war or peace in, in any way. But I, I think that, that I, I then have to take it on on a different, different approach. And, and Maybe a little bit on the first speaker talking about uh, there will be, be no, no peace without democracy. And, and if we take, see what's happening at the moment, I think that we are, we are in, in a kind of economical warfare in, in, in different areas. And of course, I start with the background I have that what have you seen? I've been, been the CEO now for Orleans Banken in 15 years. I started a couple of months before Bernstein and Lehman Brothers went down, so the financial crisis started. Uh, after the financial crisis, the last 15 years, we have been fighting financial stability and, and economical growth by central banks. If I take Federal Reserve from USA, if I take the European Central Bank, if I take the central banks from Japan and China, those, those four, four central, bank, central banks, they have pro provided 20 trillions of liquidity over those 15 years, expanding their balance sheet to make stability and growth. And they have bought government bonds a lot because what the governments have done is they have been supporting their nations by spending. We need to spend money to keep the growth up. Uh, we used to have a situation when we entered the European Union, when we agreed upon how should a country, uh, what kind of debt should we take on, what kind of deficit. Uh, during the last couple of years of the crisis we have seen, no one really seems to care. 
we have that in agreement, but we are not following that. And so we, we see countries now, especially if I look in, in Europe, our democra uh, the democracies there, we have countries with record deficits and debt. We have central banks that now have uh, a balance sheet that is approximately 30 trillion. And for the first 10 years, the central banks were able to give out money and to, to, to uh, take down interest rate without inflation coming. And that, that is a very, very lucky situation because if I can print one dollar and one more and why every new dollar is, it has the same value as before, I can just continue. And, and I think a lot of economists have been talking about where is the inflation? Well, I think people see the inflation coming now. And, and I think that most agree upon how shall we handle this kind of economic situation. There is only one way. We need growth. We need our economy to keep on growing because if it doesn't do that, we, there is no able that we can provide the, the population in our countries with those things that the, pop, uh, the politicians already have promised them. We need growth. Okay, that we, we can agree upon. What is happening uh, on, on, on supporting growth? Well, if you look back at the last couple of decades, a lot of things that has supported the growth in the world has been globalization. Free trade. By doing globalization, we have been able to do more businesses. We have grown our, our, our uh, factories. We have done more and more things. Now we are in a, an economical warfare because China and USA have said that they are really taking on each other now from an economical point of view. Uh, this started during, during the Trump era when, when the US said that now, now enough is enough with China. Uh, there used to be tariffs between the countries that was 3 to 6%. Now they are 20. So if China exports to US or US export to China, there is a 20% tariff to make it, make it, make it more, more expensive. Is that a problem? Well, it definitely is killing, killing growth and free trade. And if I look at Europe, uh, export in U.S. is not a big issue. If you look at the value of the export in U.S. For, uh, regarding G GDP, it's only 10%. If you look at China, it's only 20%. If I go to Europe, it's 30%. And if I take a country like Germany, it's 50%. So Europe is very, very much more dependent on exports than U.S. and China. But it doesn't stop with that because the name of the game and the, the, the thing that we are now doing to each other, that is sanctions. We are firing with cannons on each other by sanctions. There is financial sanctions, there are trade sanctions, and they are increasing in very, very many large numbers. And this is the problem that we are doing this. There are, is always a reason. There is always a reason why we should do it. But if I come back to our, our European countries, where I think that a lot of our European countries, the democracy is very, very weak. It's weak from the point of view that we are, the politician can't really come up with bad news to the, to the public. You will not be re-elected. You will be thrown out. And this, uh, since we are now, uh, I would say that in, in many of those areas, if I would be at the gambling, gambling table, I would say, we are all in. We are all in. Uh, there is not much more to put in there. We have inflation, so central banks can't do anything more. We have government that, are, that really can't spend anymore. And on top of that, we are killing global trade. So where should we get the growth from? That will not come. And this will, means that we have to, to stay, take a step back. We have to reverse all the sanctions and all the limitation we are putting on ourselves. It will be hard because there are always a good reason why we are sanctioning someone. 
Uh, but uh, if we don't do it, I think that will eventually be very unstable for our democracies in Europe, mm. and eventually that, that will probably be, be uh, unsecure for, for, mm. for Europe. It's very interesting because it, it seems to me that even though you come from two very different points of view, uh, Peter and Neta, you end up in a kind of common um, ground uh, step that is of retreat in a sense, or retreat in, in the sense of, um, well, abstaining from the offensive side that has been dominant in recent times. So you wanted to be asked, Netta, what do you mean by defensive defense? And then uh, Peter can continue with his uh, taking back the sanctions and how that would affect. Well, I want to first address the issue of the sanctions. Just mm -hmm. go straight for that, because I think we have very different views. Um, there's, there, there are certain assumptions about military spending that are common, but often just plain wrong. And so let, I want to put that on one side. Mm -hmm. And then the assumption about sanctions on the other side. So let's just deal with sanctions first. Um, sanctions are the denial of customary activities. In this case, it's trade and um, access to money. And the, the trade and the access to money are providing, or could provide a, a state with a wherewithal to maintain a long war because money is required to maintain a long war. You can't just use the stocks you have. Or you run out, and the Russians are running out of their stocks. They're running out of their people, and they're running out of their stuff, the war material that they need. Okay, so I think, think the sanctions are vital to maintain um, because uh, in the first instance, it slows down the offensive military capability of the Russians, but we can't assume that sanctions alone will work. But I think that they're, they're important to maintain um, because they uh, reduce the capacity of states to act in the long run. And that's what, th this is a long war now. We must reduce the capacity of the state to act. And I think uh, letting uh, that society have uh, unhindered access to material and to finances will lead to um, the haste, you know, a, a, a quicker end to the war perhaps, um, but one that's unfavorable to the Ukrainians. Um, and then on the assumptions about military spending, you know, the, the dominant assumption is that military spending is good for an economy. Actually, that's not so uh, for two reasons. Uh, one is that if you're, you care about jobs, military spending per million dollars spent or any, any other currency you want to use is relatively less uh, it, it productive of jobs. Uh, that's because uh, armed, uh, armaments production is capital intensive and it's also extremely high wage for, the, for this, that sector. Um, you're making material that is bespoke. It's uh, very technically often um, difficult to, to make, which is why it's capital intensive. It uses materials which are not common. Um, you know, uh, for instance, the skin of an aircraft that is uh, deflective or radar absorbing, so it cannot be seen. Um, so I think that uh, if you think that your economy is going to get better by lots of military spending, I, you're, you're wrong generally. It doesn't do better. But military spending is useful to politicians because it, they think it brings jobs to their, their community when actually they could get more jobs another way. But this is a, a myth, essentially, that is um, handy because, of course, uh, Lobbyists like to tell, defense industry lobbyists like to tell their member of parliament or government that, of course, jobs depend in their location on that spending. So um, those, are, those are two things I think um, that are important to say. Uh, and and the, other, the, the last thing I want to say about sanctions, going back to that, is that we often have these views about war, that it's, it's going to be quick, effective, decisive, there'll be low casualty, you can control it, um, that it's going to be cheaper than the alternative of sanctions, right? Or of diplomatic isolation. 
when in actuality, wars are often not controllable, uh, more expensive, and they're hardly ever quick, and they're rarely cheaper than those alternatives. So I think maintaining sanctions and uh, maintaining um, uh, 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 robust, robust support of Ukraine is essential. Right, but it seems to me that you're talking about two different types of sanctions, aren't you? Peter, would you like to? No, I, I totally agree uh, and regarding Russia, Russia and the sanctions. I, we, we probably would have been more successful if we, we, we would have reacted with sanctions more uh, when, when they actually took Crimea in 2014. We, we didn't do, do en enough. That, that is very, very obvious at the moment. And, and also, from an economical perspective, Russia is really not important. We always have to remember that they have nuclear power, uh, not nu nuclear, nuclear weapons, but as an economy, they, they, they are really small guys. Uh, so, and and my, 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 uh, my, my speech about the, the, the sanctions and those things is the total economy that we have to, to regain trust and start to bring that back. Because if we are now in a situation where, where we are we are, we are more and more getting into this, it's we or them, it's we or them, and you are doing, uh, we, we should continue to do trades just by uh, some of our friends, those you can trust, mm -hmm. though other guys you should actually keep, keep away. Mm -hmm. That is, on a global view, that is not the win, winning, winning mm -hmm. concept. None. Um, you have been thinking a lot about military spending and the budgets of different countries, and and I think this is a, an open discussion still. How much military spending is optimal, in a sense, or how do we? What is the knowledge we have concerning military spending and the development level of countries and and their. Um, position in the world economy, but also perhaps in terms of democracy? Um, so as, as you know, Ned had mentioned, um, there's a huge amount of literature that is in agreement that uh, military spending is not, let's say, good for the economy because of the opportunity costs, mm -hmm. that the same amount of money can be spent on other more productive activities, uh, infrastructure development, healthcare, education, that can in the long term provide more economic development mm -hmm. than spending that dollar on the military. Um, but I think we all kind of agree that all countries, countries need some level of military spending for their security. And of course the question is, well, how much is too much? Mm -hmm. Or what is the optimal? Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's very difficult to really find, let's say, the, the most optimal point or the, 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 you know, the, the yeah, the point where it's at the optimal where any dollar extra that is, let's say, bringing a, a marginal decrease to the utility of the country. But I think there is kind of a gold standard or a best practices on how countries should allocate, let's say, resources to the military. And what I mean by that is um, countries generally should have, let's say, a, a definition or understanding of what is their, what is the issues that are most, that leads to the most insecurity find definitions, define that, list that, and draft that, let's say, in a national defense strategy or national defense white paper. And with that strategy, then you can start thinking about, well, with, if these are the threats, how can we allocate resources to, let's say, minimize uh, mm. these threats? Mm. So spending is very much linked to policy, to real life policy in terms of security. Mm. And of course, once you link that, you get the point of, let's say, best practices in resource management. And then it's about well, having transparent, open uh, budgetary discussions that bring in you know, parliamentarians, bring in civil society to really discuss should X amount of money be allocated to the military or to other uh, competing sectors. Mm. And through that uh, sense of oversight and accountability, um, you get to a level of spending that matches, let's say, policy. And this is kind of where you know, uh, part of the work that we do at CIPRI is look at the transparency of military expenditure, mm -hmm. so that we can follow expenditure decisions, budget line items, to see that what the governments are spending is very much linked to what they say needs to be spent on. Mm -hmm. And if it isn't, um, decision makers or policy uh, makers are essentially then can be held accountable for, let's say, wasteful spending. Mm -hmm. uh, in the extreme case, of course, cases of corruption, uh, mismanagement, misuse of resources. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, so if you follow this entire process, you get uh, a sense of really best practices of resource management 
and as resources are used in a more efficient or optimal manner, it frees up, of course, more resources in your finite pot of money that can be allocated to, uh, let's call it social expenditure. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and taken together, uh, you know, we consider the idea that you can then improve not only, let's say, military security because you're addressing your threats, but you're improving human security. Overall security and the quality of democracy, in a, in a sense, about how how decisions are taken. But it seems to me that you are, on the one hand, you are discussing the psychological level of insecurity in markets as well as in in politics. Uh, the, us uh, and them and who will uh, survive. So it seems to be one problem, and that is perhaps what you meant, Netta, this, the beliefs uh, about the, the system and the insecurity. Uh, and I'm wondering how you think uh, in a political sense or in economic sense, but also as a business person, you have said also, Peter, that you're in the business of trust. <laughs> um, how do we uh, deal with this uh, psychological perspective, which uh, some, some people have been talking for a long time about risk societies and mm -hmm. being uh, spiraling this uh, sense of we are unable to cope with insecurity. Uh, and, and this has been meaning that the concept of security has been militarized I would say, from, from my perspective, more and more, where the response, and, and I, I guess, Neta, perhaps that is what you say when you say we need to keep up the sanctions, because that is a better, a less militarized alternative than the full offensive uh, annihilation of the opponent. So that's the, the psychological. And then, you, Nan, you come with the institutional perspective. And that was also uh, partly what you said uh, too in different ways, that, that we need to find ways in different societies for how should the decisions about these difficult and very open questions today be taken. Who would like to start? Netta, you are nodding. Yeah. Would you like to, to? There's so much there. Yes. Um, OK, so in another life, I write about fear. And um, in particular, I'm interested in you know, the neuropsychology of fear. right? So um, everybody knows that um, our brains developed you know, in a certain way over you know, a long period of time, many millions of years, it, evolutionary psychology and biology tell us that we have uh, a limbic system, what they call a limbic system. And it, inside our heads, we've got the amygdala, which is the fear processing center. So what we know is that when people are frightened, their amygdalas become more active. And if we live in an insecure environment, our amygdalas can stay activated. And what we also know more, from more recent research in neuroscience is that uh, you your, your genes are not the end of the story, right? There's something called epigenetics where uh, changes in the environment can change the activation of your genes and those changes can be passed on, which is another new finding. Uh, that that uh, if you live in, this may explain a lot about societies where there's no conflict resolution and why conflict goes on. If you live in societies where fear is endemic, um, you're more prone to look at the other, however different they are, and uh, see someone who has uh, ill intention toward you. You're less likely to see and comprehend the signals that they give you that are more friendly, right? That are, or at least neutral. You'll take the evidence and sort of interpret it as I have to defend myself. So there's a, a, a lot of work on this on the individual brain level but we can also see it in cultures. What we do when we have um, large military spending is we're institutionalizing our fear. We've institutionalized our concern about the other. And what, what I've noticed uh, is in the United States, for example, in the post 9-11 wars, every year since 9-11, uh, the, there's two kinds of military spending in the US, war spending or overseas contingency operations spending, which is emergency war spending. Right, and that's really not monitored too much by Congress. And there's base military spending that covers everything else the military does. Okay, so the, the base military spending goes up, 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 except for one year, 2013. 
And then war spending fluctuates depending on what the, the U.S. is doing in any one place. But what I'm saying about the base military spending going up, 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 is we've institutionalized that fear, that trauma of the 9-11 wars, whereas prior to that, base military spending had been stable and projected to go down. So that's the psychology that is individual, that becomes cultural inst and institutionalized, and it's hard to get out of that. Um, and then I, I, I have many other things to say, but I'll stop. Mm -hmm. Nam, do you uh, want to yeah, jump? Yeah, maybe I'll just jump in quickly and say that, you know, uh, something we we'll consider is, like I say, you meant topics like peaceful versus militarized economies. Mm -hmm. and, and I think one measure that I think uh, from the work that we do at CIPRI that you can use to really think about this is to look at military spending as a share of a country's GDP, gross domestic product. Mm -hmm. So the higher the proportion, the greater the cost the military has on a country's economy. And so you can look at a country like Sweden where I think many would consider that it is not a militarized economy because it spends a lot on social welfare. Uh, and in Sweden's case, its military spending as shared GDP is at around 1.2%. So generally considered very low. Um, but then the narrative, of course, you see when people discuss, let's say, China, is that it is becoming increasingly militarized. That is, it is allocating more and more money to the military. But then when you look at the, the, the data, you see that China has really kept uh, the military burden or, or the cost of military on the economy stable for about the past two decades. That it's really tracked, military spending has really tracked, uh, it be in, on track with uh, economic development. So around about, let's say, 1.5% of GDP. So barely, uh, relatively, a bit more than Sweden. Mm -hmm. so, so if you think about that, maybe China should not be seen, let's say, from that way as militarized. But the narrative really has been put forward that it is, let's say, challenging the US right, for, uh, uh, within the Asia Pacific region or maybe uh, globally. But, but rather, um, in terms of how much money, how much resources is being allocated. In that case, not so much. And unless Peter has something to, to he's very eager to, to say at this moment, I would like to ask whether we really have the tools, because b both of you uh, seem to say that, in fact, it's difficult to trace military spending uh, in, in a satisfactory way, at least in the US. That was very clear, what Netta said about the different types of spending and wh how we're monitoring, but also what the political um, the political insight and decision-making space is in, in these respects. And, and how, I, I guess that you have heard this question before, how transparent can China really be? Um, and and uh, I, I have seen um, now that you are talking on the one hand about the budgeting, which is one uh, thing, then you have the accounts and the end result and the discussion about the end result. So perhaps you would like to, to comment on this. Shall we start by Nan? Um, yeah, sure. So I think there's a general re correlation relationship between uh, transparency in all forms of budgeting and uh, democracy. That countries that are more democratic, that have stronger institutions, tend to be more transparent. Um, I mean, they have to be held accountable to civil society, to its electorate. So in a way, that's uh, a given. Mm -hmm. And so in the case of the US, um, you are bombarded with information, too much information for you to go through, uh, uh, the level of transparency, essentially. Uh, in the case of, of China, um, yes, you don't get much information. But I think then our analysis would be that what the Chinese report is not complete to what we think they allocate to the military spending. So that's why uh, CIPRI's estimates are always quite a bit larger than what the Chinese government uh, reports, because mm -hmm. we believe that it doesn't report on research and development. It often doesn't report on uh, certain procurement, mm -hmm. uh, you know, weapon systems. It doesn't uh, really group in uh, the paramilitary forces that really are trained and equipped to mm -hmm. perform military activities, let's mm -hmm. say, in the South China Sea with its Coast Guard. So. There are all these extra categories that, um, through, I guess, our analysis, we feel that should be considered uh, military. Mm. That, that isn't. And so we even add these mm. extra categories in. Mm. But for, for most countries, um, I think it is generally quite transparent. You'd be surprised mm. that we're able to get data for about 155 countries where we actually have primary sources mm. uh, to, to back up that data. 
So, um, I guess I'm... <laughs> That's one of the positive things, then, that we can acclaim. Uh, but uh, you, you have indicated that many countries keep out some elements of their activities. You have uh, mentioned about um, non-formal military forces, and you have uh, the, the development work that is done. And Netta, would you like to comment on the American experience on this? Mm -hmm. But perhaps also... Yeah. Um, you can still return to the issue of costs because you have, you have also shown a great interest about the costs of military activity on the environment. Mm -hmm. And that is something that, of course, in, in our sustainability times uh, is crucial. Uh, and, and I, as a lawyer, I'm, I'm surprised that military activities are always kept completely outside many of the new environmental undertakings. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have seen in the deep sea, for instance, which is beyond territorial jurisdiction. Uh, so it's a little bit surprising. How, how, how are the transparency tools, and what do we mean really by costs of war? Okay, so quickly on US military spending. Um, I'm the person in the cost of war project who's been tracking for the last 13 years US military spending on war. And it's surprisingly not as transparent as we'd like it to be. I mean, my, my reports go into why this is the case. Um, but I can at least eventually come up with an estimate, right, that's, that's comprehensive. Um, and then the DOD will disagree with me, and they, and they come for me, and then I say, well, here's why. Okay, that's fine. Um, but that's, that's the, the thing that's problematic about the U.S. is that it is not as, as transparent as it should be. Um, and it's not easy for members of Congress to understand military spending. And then there's the fact that the DOD has not pa passed an audit ever. Never had an audit until recently and not passed an audit. Um, and what do you mean by DOD? Department think, of Defense, yes. sorry. Um, okay, I'll s I'm, I went to MIT and we spoke in mac acronymical tongues there, so <laughs> stop me. Um, Okay, so then about um, military spending more generally. We're at a moment, and you just, uh, you, you are documenting this amply at CIPRI, uh, in the last couple of years, where military spending has increased and will increase. Governments are uh, increasing their military spending dramatically in response to the war in Ukraine. I think that this is unnecessary. It may be politically useful, but I think it is unnecessary. And, and I'm very uh, firm on this for two reasons. One is if your anticipated adversary, and NATO's adversary is Russia in this case, if your anticipated adversary is sp spending its blood and treasure and equipment at the rate that they're spending it at the end of this conflict, even if they take all of Ukraine, but they, I don't believe they will, they'll be weaker. Okay, so you, you will build up your own forces against an adversary that is greatly weakened. They've run out of uh, certain kinds of equipment uh, that mostly, am they're running out of ammunition. Um, they're spending their uh, tanks and aircraft and they're having their, uh, dramatically, some of their ships blown up or disabled. Um, this is, will be a greatly weakened military power as weak as in uh, after they withdrew from Afghanistan, okay? Secondly, there's a legitimation crisis uh, un, uh, underway in Russia. That may be a period of great instability, but we will see a change there, I think, politically. But regardless of whether or not that comes to fruition, I believe that uh, we're just, it's, it's not wise to spend that much money on responding to a greatly weakened adversary. Um, I, I could go on. Okay, environmental costs. Um, there is a belief that uh, climate change will cause instability, increased migration, and potentially war, right? It's commonly talked about as you know, climate change caused war is, or instability is coming to a neighborhood near you. But what we forget uh, is that war 
is a cause, not the only cause, but is a cause of climate change. And this is in two respects. One is in terms of emissions from direct military activity, that is installations and bases, as well as operations, right? So you've got those, those kinds of military activities. And then you've got war itself, that is the destruction of stuff, that is the burning of cities, um, the, the blowing up of pipelines and oil infrastructure, and um, also uh, the destruction of the natural environment. That, you know, the, the Ukrainian president recently said that five million acres of Ukrainian forest were destroyed by the Russians in the first six months or so of that war. Uh, in uh, Iraq, uh, marshlands were disrupted and destroyed. So we're destroying the ability of the atmosphere to capture carbon, right, and to keep it stored. And this historically has occurred, right? In, uh, in many wars, forests were targeted. So that, that's not unusual. So the destruction of the natural environment is an act of war. It is also um, outlawed in part of the Geneva Convention. So uh, uh, war causes climate change. So increasing military activity in anticipation of a possible threat is actually increasing your vulnerability and risk on another front, which is climate. Now, why, why care about military emissions? How important is that? Uh, military emissions, uh, at least, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very familiar with the U.S. case. Military emissions by the U.S. are the greatest source of emissions in the United States because the, the U.S. military is the largest energy user in the United States. It is the world's single, single largest petroleum user, okay? And it, at 51 million metric tons in the last two years, its emissions are larger than most countries in the world. Right? And why is that? Because it has, uh, it's a global military presence. And um, so I believe that we, what we need to do is, is transition to not just lower spending. Spending needs to be, uh, as you suggested, lined up with doctrine. And doctrine should be more defensive. And also then uh, it could be greener. Though that's, there's a lot of work to be done to get there. And, and Peter, you have been working a lot on the greening of the economy, you can say. At the same time, you have also explained, also in your latest interview, that, uh, that you find it very difficult to take a clear stand on the issue of investments in uh, the uh, arms production. And that's a very huge debate in Finland at the moment, in Sweden too. Uh, which I think is extremely interesting in, in, at very many different levels. Uh, first, because it shows that uh, not only states are important actors in how do you create these offensive or defensive mentalities and also policies, uh, but also in, in um, managing the, the savings or the assets of, of uh, the ordinary citizens. And it puts, uh, I guess, quite a lot of burden on your shoulders too. How are you thinking about this? And, and not only your bank, but the banking world in general. How do you see that discussion? I think it, if I maybe not know the, the, Nord, the, the banking industry in the Nordics, best and and I think that was where very much much common 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 in that way that not really many many banks allowed investments in you you usually have the pornography and alcohol and and gambling and then military military spending it's always difficult to say for companies because a lot of things can be used both for civil industry and for military industry so we used to have the, that that rule of thumb that five percent maximum five percent can can go to to military military spending from from a company if we, we should invest in that and then uh, that was really not an issue i would say in finnish bank or in swedish bank that this is a how you behave you, you you put your money out out of those things and you you put your customers money out out of those things but of course when when the when 24th of, of february last year uh 
I really, really got, got that wake-up call. And, and I had this uh, in 2019. Our bank celebrated uh, 100 year, and we we had invited the former president of U.S. Uh, Bill Clinton. He, he was here on Orland Islands, and and I had an opportunity to be up, up on the scene and have this kind of discussion with him. And I asked him about also the, the Orland Island, <laughs> our our example of the. the and uh, he that, that has been out there working in, in different kind of conflicts and, and could we use the Orland all, all situation out there. And he said that, that, of course, you should be very proud of what, what you have achieved on Orland Island and you should be out there market, marketing uh, as much as you can because it obviously has been a huge success. But Peter, remember that you always need to have the right to defend yourself. And that was... was 24th of February, when I wake up on 25th and saw, saw what had happened, I really got that. Uh, we need to have the right to defend ourselves. And if we put all the money outside the military industry, that was a question. With the heart, it says we shouldn't, we shouldn't put money in, into military industry. Suddenly, the brain said, maybe we need to have it to def defend democracy and, and to be able to, to be there. So uh, uh, I, I'm still struggling with the issue, I must say. Mm. Uh, it's not an easy one, but uh, I changed my mind I actually very much that, that, that day. I guess that means interesting discussions in the board of directors of Orland's bank and other banks. I think you, many, many, many yes. banks. And, uh, but possibly also in, in the, breakfast t t the, the breakfast table in, in many families about what does it really mean and, and what is um, our position and our ethical code in our family about these things. But if I may counter a little bit the narrative, and I'm not talking now about one particular bank, but about generally what we know in the Nordic countries, uh, it seems that at least since the mid-2015, perhaps that was really the, the cutting point, the interest for military investment by investors and banks has been very great. And we have seen that in big studies. And, and perhaps um, the big debate has been concerning investing in um, military uh, production companies, arms uh, exporters that export it to controversial countries and controversial situations, either ongoing conflicts where there is no clear right of self-defense. So the Ukraine case is rather an easy case, yes, because the, no one doubts this right to defend yourself. Uh, the question is, how do you do? It, how do you deal with all these arms that are exported in? other parts. And of course, the, the, the most um, dreadful of, of data at the moment seems to be that already less than a year, some of the arms that we have been exporting are returning back to our own organized crime. So we have the, the state uh, actors, including the military. We have the private businesses, but we also have organized crime. And, and, and I'm wondering to all three of you to what extent that has been an issue, because I think that organized crime has, has had a, a dreadful um, significance in many of the conflicts in the African uh, continent, the, the diamonds and uh, rare metals um, industry, liquid gas perhaps now in some parts, uh, and, and also in Colombia with, with the drug trafficking. So we have to keep track, track of three levels of major actors. Uh, how, do we, how do we think about defensive defense mm -hmm. in such a, a, a troubling set of, of major powers? Netta. Yeah, so um, there's a lot there. I think about the necessity of self-defense as um, unquestioned, right? So it, it, it's justified. Okay, um, then you ask yourself, what is the self to be defended? How far out does that self extend? Do you want to defend your neighbor? Do you want to defend your ally? Okay, and then you structure your force to be able to do that. You, uh, you structure your relationships. And then what does it mean to defend? And that's what I was getting at earlier. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Sweden has a civilian component to their defense system. 
Uh, the United States does not have a civilian component. It's all professional military with the occasional contractor, now increasingly large numbers of contractors, pulled in to supplement the military. So you could say it's the United States military plus mercenaries, people who are paid to, to do certain jobs. In, in many cases, the difference between mercenary and criminal is kind of fuzzy, many, many parts of the world. Um, so, um, but, but then the, the point of a defensive doctrine that includes civilians is so that you can defend your territory, deny access to, make it more difficult for someone to take and hold which is what a military does. They take and hold territory so that you can establish political control. So if the people are prepared to take and, and uh, defend their territory, um, like the Ukrainians did in the first weeks of the assault, which is they, they uh, misdirected the Russians, uh, they stood in front of the Russian tanks, they slowed them down so that they spent a lot of time driving around um, then uh, ran out of uh, fuel for their tanks and got stuck there and were then sitting ducks for the pro professional military to come in or uh, civilians to come in and shoot at them. I think that that's a doctrine that can buy you time, and which, which is what it did, so that you can get help. And they've made their certain parts of Ukraine ungovernable. But what they have there is a mix of civilian-based defense and a professional military. Right, so you can, you can have a society that has that as their military doctrine. It will then, in a sense, militarize the people to a certain degree, right? They, they are prepared to participate in war, and that raises questions about um, the, the clear distinction between civilian and military. In, under international law, you are not permitted to deliberately target a civilian. Right now, a civilian, if a civilian is actively participating in the defense of their country, they're not, they've moved into another territory. They can be targeted. And they're all mixed in with the other civilians. Right? And, and that poses the problem, well, then th if they're a legitimate target, then the school next door to them is a, is, will necessarily be harmed. So it's very difficult to make this transition. It's difficult to do it in the midst of a war. But if a society like uh, you know, Germany, were to move to defensive defense, making their state ungovernable, they become extremely unattractive. Um, and it becomes a, like a, a costly and losing proposition to defend uh, uh, or to attack a country that is so well defended. Mm -hmm. So, um, but you know, I, I, on small arms, I can't answer you. That's just too, that's too far outside my mm -hmm. thing. Uh, yeah, so, so briefly, I think, you know, my, when I, when I view defense, or maybe let's say uh, security, um, I think it should definitely be more than military security, state security. Because if we think about what each of us are most worried about, it could be job security, right? It is really about uh, maybe climate security, food security. And so we really should really expand the definition of security or defense, or security, let's say, to, to really be about human security. So suddenly, if we then think about, let's say, the right to defend oneself and the investments, let's say, into uh, arms, arms companies, uh, the same consideration should be the case that, well, that's just one aspect, right? The greater investment, whether it's from individuals or from companies, should really be about the greater aspect of security uh, in other sectors, more productive uh, sectors. Um, and I think maybe linking to the point about, let's say, uh, small arms, the proliferation of small arms uh, into organized crime, um, a really good example you can see is what happened uh, in Libya, right? When the government collapsed, there was suddenly was this immense proliferation of small arms from Libya across the border to the Sahel region, mm -hmm. where there are actors now uh, in Nigeria um, that have essentially gained hold of these weapons and become militant groups. Become, they move from maybe small organized crime groups to now really forces that are disrupting the country itself. Mm -hmm. uh, attacks on oil pipelines, kidnappings, um, guns mm -hmm. that have suddenly been flown, uh, 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 well, flown to uh, the farmer herder conflicts. I mean, these weapons all came from somewhere. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this really came from Libya and how the movement of that. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I'm not really, you know, it's nothing about, let's say, the, the, how one should be careful about uh, 
giving weapons uh, or military aid to Ukraine, but rather we should really consider and really think about the proliferation of weapons and how that's being used. I think now there's a lot of um, work being done um, into when a country exports weapons, there's a lot of arms control. Um, um, that not only is about where it's going, but once the, the weapons uh, arrive at the country, that there are then post-shipment control checks mm -hmm. where the export that is going years after the weapon has been delivered to check whether those weapons are still there mm. where the buyer said they are and not has been proliferated to other mm. countries. Mm. And I think this is a, a huge concern in mostly Middle East, Sub-Saharan Africa, North Africa regions. Mm. Um, Tracing. Peter, do you want to start the final round? What do you take with you out of this vast discussion and the discussion about mentalities as well as institutions? Well, I think that, that in the end, everything comes down to what we talked about. It, it's trust. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I saw, saw uh, there was obviously the, the the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, they have something called uncertainty index uh, that they are mm -hmm. been following for 25, 25 years or more. more and, and that uncertainty index is an all-time high by far. Um, so what, what it actually means is that the future is much, much harder to predict. It's, so in a way, we need to, to predict the unpredictable. Uh, and then how to end that and, and come down. I'm, I don't know much about diplomacy and on those things, but the, the, it has to come there. But I do know how, how to run a relationship bank. Mm -hmm. And, and on, the, on the one of our walls inside our bank, we have how do you create a relation? Mm -hmm. How do you create a relation? And, and it's in a way, how do you get old friends? And usually it starts by sitting down and talk. And you put some kind of common ambition there. And then, after that, you do what you had promised. That is usually how you keep a relationship. And you do it over time. Again and again. And should we get trust? We need to come back to that. And uh, in some areas, it, it, at the moment, it feels like we are very, very far. But eventually, we need to come back to that. Mm -hmm. How to be, build relationships. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Nan, would you like to have your final summary or impression, perhaps? Sure. Um, just following up on what Peter said about trust and uh, dialogue, cooperation. I think right now we are further away from you know, these major superpowers speaking to each other than we have been in the last two, three decades. I'm not sure if there's even an open channel of communication between China and the US right now. And so really, first, but working towards, again, dialogue, cooperation, bring back multilateralism. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think something really relates to maybe peace, war, and money is that the current environment we're in is that, again, we are all competing. All these sectors are competing for a finite number of resources. And what we have seen in the last couple of years is that the threats to humanity um, is climate change. It's the fact that there will be another pandemic uh, of a different form. And these are non-military threats with non-military solutions. And so despite what governments are really you know, announcing and perceived threats about increasing military spending, um, the limited amount of resources and the other important needs that government needs to allocate resources to, I think it's very important that we think long and hard, governments think long and hard about the, these increased in military spending. Mm -hmm. And us as civil society and interested individuals, citizens, should question government and really hold them accountable mm -hmm. for wasteful expenditure, unnecessary mm -hmm. expenditure. And I think finally, um, it all comes to a head where there are consequences to all the spending that really comes from us individuals whether you increase taxes, where you increase debt, it's either going to be the generation, our generation, or the future generation that's going to, let's say, pay for a lot of these uh, excess expenditure. Mm. 
So, so this means also, of course, that uh, many of the Hollandic parliamentarians uh, that are here have to keep all this in mind. What, what are the issues you're bringing into your policies and how do you prioritize in, in the resource allocation? So it's not only in, in the abstract, I guess. And Netta, you will have the final word. Well, nothing we talk about here is easy. Right? We're not in an easy moment uh, in the world. I mean, it's just so darn clear, right? And I look at my daughter and son and say, whoa, you know, not such a great um, world you have. But on the other hand, we have made it this way, right? We have made the institutions and practices and we have these beliefs, uh, we can remake the institutions and the practices. So, you know, I'm all for cutting military spending, but it can't just be across the board cuts. It has to be matched to a doctrine. And the doctrine shouldn't be the same old doctrine that has made the world this way. It has to be a doctrine that is less provocative, yet can still get the job done, right? So that we're not into arms expenditure races, but we're, we're actually uh, not uh, increasing uh, insecurity on the other side. So that's so one thing. So I think we can reduce military spending if we have uh, a rethink of doctrine. Now, the problem with that is that the way that military spending works when you buy equipment is you, you buy an aircraft carrier in the U.S. incrementally. We've got 13 of them. We're going to buy another couple and, and the surface ships that go along with them. And they're on timelines that take 5, 10, 15 years to make. And we've got a new fighter aircraft, which, is, which took more than a decade and will cost millions and millions of dollars per, for aircraft. So we have to think not just about um, you know, what the transition is, but what we will do with those industries which we're asking to transition. So it requires not just that military forces and doctrines are, are, are altered to be more defensive and safer and cheaper, but that we figure out what will we do with all that manufacturing capacity so that you can still defend yourself, but that you're not um, buying e the same old equipment. The same old equipment will not be required. So it's an economic transition that we need as well as a doctrinal transition, which can lead to a decrease in total spending. And uh, I, I am, hopeful that if we understand very clearly about the world we have made through our choices, that we can very clearly make different choices. And that's where I hope we are. I think we will end with this hopeful note that it is possible to do things differently. Uh, because it has been done in Europe, it has been done in Finland, which went through a civil war and uh, the, the Second World War traumas, uh, and which has changed its economy and also its uh, political doctrines. It has been done in Germany, and it has been done in many other countries that have gone through both civil war and, and uh, dictator dictatorial regimes. It seems to me that it also asks for a rethinking of the, the growth economy relation to, to our doctrines. So that uh, is another uh, aspect for perhaps the next or a coming uh, peace uh, talks at Kastelholm. But I thank you all, and above all, I, th I thank all the participants that have sent questions to you. We have not been uh, mentioning them one by one, but they were brought into this uh, bunch of questions that you have received. And it's, um, it's a very optimistic also turn that we see how people want to engage in this type of discussion. Never before have we received so many questions to be directed to our speakers. So a big applaud to all of you and above all to the speakers. Thank you.